Everything I needed to learn about comedy, I learned watching Warner Brothers cartoons. I think there's a part of us that's forever 12 years old. I am a man. I know it's for kids. That seems kind of adult in a way. Oh my God, they've killed Kenny. Comedians make good voice actors because they have made a career on just being themselves. There's tremendously funny lines in Toy Story. Look, I'm Picasso. I don't get it. You get so many chances to be funny in animation. The writing, the voice talent, animation, boom. There's something about moving cartoons that really delights us. A cartoon is comedy coming to life, and that's kind of interesting and magical. That's it. I've had enough of your tomfoolery. The wildest thing you can think of is accomplished just by drawing it. So whether it's The Simpsons, The Family Guy, your imagination is unlimited in animation. In animation, you can like have people ripping apart each other's guts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing that I like to say is that live action is just low budget animation. That's right, he can be taught. Visual jokes, the best of them are often in animated cartoons. Don't be nervous, kid. Dr. Yakko's the most gentle dentist in the whole wide world. It's just a drill that hurts. I think in some ways the progression of comedy has been to move more and more towards animation. Cartoons, if they're done right, can convey comedy very precisely. And if you think of it and it's funny, you can make it happen. Animation and comedy goes right back to the extreme beginning of film. At the end of the 20s, start of the 30s, comedy shorts were very popular in cinema. So the big stars were people like Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton. Cartoons were also film shorts shown in theaters. Some of the early cartoons were loaded with starring characters like Coco the Clown and Felix the Cat. But then Mickey Mouse comes along and is considered the first sound cartoon character. Not only did Walt Disney add sound with the first Mickey Mouse cartoon, but they were funny sounds. At the time, there was no animation to look at because no one was doing animation. So they looked at Chaplin, or they looked at Buster Keaton, or they looked at Laurel and Hardy. Because it was all about physical performance and the silence, that was a good way for them to hone up their animation skills. Chaplin said, oh my gosh, Mickey Mouse is going to put me out of work because the mouse could do magically almost anything. Meanwhile, the Fleischer studio was Disney's biggest rival. The cartoons were in black and white, and they're grittier, they're dirtier, and they've got a lot of weirdo characters that you'd only find in the subway. Max Fleischer Studios had a tendency to feel more adult than the other studios. Betty Boop had this garter that fell down and slipped up, so there was a sex component to her. When Popeye and Bluto fought, it was violent. Popeye, as far as art goes, it's a funny drawing. It just makes you laugh when you look oh, at it. I've been waiting for you. <laughs> I'd twist your brains out, you bet. And he wasn't nasty or violent or anything. It was just he got put upon. He was not looking for trouble. Meanwhile, he could kick anybody's butt. Happy New Year! Popeye cartoons had a beat to them. You can almost tell they're made with a metronome going back and forth. They're all moving with the same beat. Ow. It was fantastic. This is Fleischer in the 30s. Ow. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Walt Disney was the only one who was genuinely interested in pushing the entire medium forward. There's a reason Disney became famous. The quality of their animation was unparalleled. It was unbelievable. By the late 1930s, Disney was now doing Snow White. 
these elaborate fairy tales, beautifully done, spectacular. The rest of the industry is trying to keep up with Disney. But some studios looked at that and said, we're going to make people laugh. Looney Tunes was all about gags, making you laugh. And when they showed those cartoons in movie theaters before a Warner Brothers movie, they would kill the same way a stand-up comedian would go up and bring down the house for an audience of adults in a theater. Shoot him now! Shoot him now! You keep out of this. He doesn't have to shoot you now. He does so have to shoot me now. I demand that you shoot me now. Yeah. The duck season, rabbit season exchange, to this day, if I watch it, I laugh hysterically because you know it's coming, but watching Daffy Duck step into it every single time is absolutely brilliant. Not again. The timing in those cartoons is so great, and it was universal comedy. You don't need to know much to understand why Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd are funny. Kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit. Kill the wabbit. Bugs Bunny is one of the most influential comedians of all time. I don't think there's anyone from my generation of comedy who didn't learn how to time a joke from Bugs Bunny. Of course you realize this means war. The Warner Brothers cartoons I think they got personalities right. You had so many different stars. You had Bugs, and you had Daffy, and you had Elmer Fudd, Yosemite Sam, Tweety and Sylvester, Foghorn Leghorn, Pepe Le Pew, and of course, the Roadrunner, the Coyote. I mean, that's quite a lot. They did pretty good. The animated stars were as big as any movie star, certainly that we knew. And as children, they were, they were much bigger. Audiences could relate to these characters. We saw ourselves in Mickey. He was us. He was the small guy fighting against the system. Bugs Bunny, who was kind of a Brooklyn street fighter, they represented us. And usually the bad guys were the landlord, the boss, the hunter, the person who was taking away something from us. And we could laugh at their antics, what they're doing to get back. It made us feel better. It empowered us. Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Wile E. Coyote, those guys, to me, were the best executors of comedy ever. If you're still laughing 60 years later at a joke, that's, that's brilliant. Television becomes a major competitor for movies starting in 1950. Because of TV, film studios started to slash their budgets. Every major film studio had an animation division. Suddenly, by the late 50s, almost none of them do. You've got people like Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera who were winning Oscars and making superior cartoons for MGM, the Tom and Jerry cartoons. They're suddenly out of work. What are they going to do? They pitched the idea of a prime time, adult-oriented sitcom. The Flintstones. Looking for something different on TV? Well, here it is. The Flintstones, that's a kid's cartoon. That's not Family Guy. But it was in 1960. Look at the first two seasons of The Flintstones. They're all adult situations. The show itself is a parody of sitcoms at the time. Don't you get it? This place is a gold mine. If we could buy it, we could get rich and be our own bosses. Look, <laughs> not. I admit that some of my past ideas weren't so hot. But this one is different. It's sure fire. Many people say, didn't you copy the Honeymooners? If you compare Flintstones to Honeymooners, that's the biggest compliment you can give me. But. The honeymoon, I don't have uh, all these gags that we had in there, which were the window dressing. Just made it. Oh, boy. If we missed it, we'd have had to walk. The way to sell a TV show in those days was to make it as cheap as possible. In limited animation, you're not going to animate the full body of the character. You got more levels on each character. There's the background, and then there's the head and the body, and we're just going to 
animate the lips on his mouth. Hanna-Barbera cartoons were bare bones, no budget, but it didn't matter because the dialogue was so snappy and so clever. Did you get your paper, dear? Yeah, and I'm lucky. It only comes once a week. I look the world in the vertical time, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle. The Jay Ward studio, of course, did Rocky and Bullwinkle, and it was very popular with adults because it kept winking at itself, saying, this is a kid's cartoon. I wonder why they're shooting at us. Must be from a rival network. It was probably the most meta humor going on in television at that time. The end of the theatrical cartoon era is kind of sad because the money went away and the enthusiasm went away with it and TV animation was more of a factory business than an inspired business. Help, help, here come the bears. Help, help, here come the bears. Help, help, here come the bears. Let's play. By the 1970s, the idea of a creator-driven animated series was pretty much gone. In general, there was much more of an emphasis on advertising. And so there was a big gap on Saturday mornings. People said, well, who's watching TV at that time? And the answer was kids. <laughs> It was television that put cartoons into the arena or ghetto, if you will, of Saturday morning. Before TV, cartoons were for everybody. There's a straitjacket put on animation that you couldn't be as funny as you wanted to be because, oh, well, it's, it's for kids and it can't be this uh, interesting. Didn't anyone ever tell you it's not polite to grab? By the 80s, we were into pound puppies. There was strawberry shortcake. There were a lot of merchandising opportunities, but they were sort of ways to sell product rather than ways to entertain or amuse kids. Eddie? Yeah? Bring in the guys. Ralph Bakshi was a mentor, and together, along with a bunch of other resentful animators at Filmation, they conspired to create cartoons as a vehicle for comedy and have them reflect an animator's sensibility. Make them funny and wacky for the sake of funny and wacky. Can Mighty Mouse save the day, or at least Saturday morning, for network television? Here I come to save the day. Oh, no, not this show. The new Adventures of Mighty Mouse came on, and it was totally disregarding <laughs> the things that you were not supposed to do. And it was like, oh, there's something new happening in animation. There's something going on here. The Mighty Mouse show was just fast-paced, funny, silly. It had weird characters in it. It had little segments that almost made no sense. The non sequitur kind of humor. No one was doing that kind of stuff at that point. I haven't seen this much hair since Brooke Shields trimmed her eyebrows. As animation became bold, Older and more outrageous. A series like Mighty Mouse, The New Adventures, did have controversial elements, one of the best known being the supposed um, sniffing of cocaine. I know someone else like that. There was a famous episode where Mighty Mouse sniffed a flower and became strong and flies away. This preacher led a protest, saying that this was a metaphor for cocaine use and that this cartoon show should be canceled and the pressure campaign succeeded. So the network listened to this group rather than the animators themselves who said that was never on our minds to begin with. The artists were pushing, but they'd get shut down because they had what they called outrageous ideas and subversion. But that's the, that's the meat of any cartoon. The new adventures of Mighty Mouse inspired a new generation and contingent of animators who made cartoons that they wanted to make, that they thought were funny. Spike and Mike was a touring film festival. In one screening, you would see animated shorts. They had collected them, and they had this one collection that was, like, for grown-ups. It would feature Bill Plimpton cartoons, early Mike Judge cartoons. Well, OK, but I'm, I'm going to set the building on fire. Lupo the Butcher, which was a very gory cartoon. So Spike and Mike had a lot of taboo things you wouldn't see in normal cartoons, like gore, like violence, like sex. These animators had been let off the leash. And so those early festivals were really helpful. Before the internet, they were critical. They were connecting people with an audience that they just otherwise wouldn't have had. All of us who were working in that business, we would try to slip something in that's funny, or we try to pitch a show that was funny. So when new opportunities came along to work on something that we thought could 
blossom into actually a funny animated show, we were always eager to jump at that. <gasps> Look, there we are! It may be on a lousy channel, but The Simpsons are on TV. I was originally brought in for the voice of Lisa, and when I showed up, the audition piece was on the table, and there was a picture of Lisa, but right next to her was the picture of Bart. And it said, 10 years old, underachiever, proud of it, you know, troublemaker. I'm like, oh, man, yeah. Eat my shorts. All right, I'll eat, <laughs> eat your shorts. You could have looked at TV Guide, any issue during the 60s, and I'll tell you where I was. I was watching that episode of the Flintstones or the Jetsons. But I always thought that those TV shows could have been better. They, could, they were disappointing to me. And I said, someday, if I have my own TV show, I'm going to do it different. In the 80s, there was a young crew of animators and a young crew of writers who didn't have any preconceived notions of what animation should or should not do. So there was a lot of breaking out of the three camera sitcom that you could do in animation. And to quote Monty Python, make it up as we went along. Are there any jive talking robots in this play? Mm, I don't think so. Bart, don't ask stupid questions. Is there any frontal nudity? No, Homer. The lines on The Simpsons are so sharp, and I'm so impressed with the volume of good jokes and the quality of the jokes. And it was a legendary writer's room long before I got there. It subverted the family sitcom. In fact, it was like the most realistic portrayal of a family, right. <laughs> which is crazy because it was a cartoon. The Simpsons is the hottest new series on television. If you haven't seen the animated series, it is about a family just like yours. We had kids back talking to their parents, and maybe it was because it was an, an animated format that you didn't expect to see that. Here's Bart Simpson, the most popular character on television right now, and we talked to the school principal last week who is banned Bart Simpson t-shirts because he celebrates being an underachiever. You know, there's always somebody that lies awake in bed at night uh, seething because kids find uh, uh, something really, really fun. It's the, it's the controversy of the week. All she needed was for that big slob to show her some respect. Well, at least that's what I thought. I have a history of missing a point of stuff like this. No, Homer, you got it just right. The reason that show holds together is that it's a family. It's, it sounds corny, but it is a family. They do love each other, and they're trying to maintain the family unit, and that's the oldest story there is. At last, I have control of your TV set. Is your mother there? No? Good, welcome to our secret headquarters. Deep inside the lower intestine of a sperm whale. Oh, God! God! Animation is most successful when it is fully auteur creator driven. You then have John Kay making Ren and Stimpy, and he's passing it as kids' fair, but really pretty adult cartoon on a mild kids' network. Animation had never been that gross, mm -hmm. like the boogers and the close up shots on the nose. Like, it was disgusting. Animation wasn't the same after that. I picked them myself. It was just really different, you know? The gags were different. Drinking from a toilet bowl. They broke all these rules, and you wonder, why were those rules in place? Ren and Stimpy had this crew of really great artists and animators, and the more they could just do it all themselves, the better the cartoon was going to be, because they were adding weird little funny animated touches and twitches. Ren and Stimpy created a renaissance of new animation with dialogue and visual gags and characters and voice actors that we still experience today. This new era of animation, creator-driven animation, is exploding in the early 90s. And MTV sees this and goes, we need some way to harness this. Maybe you should stick your wiener in the bug zapper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a really good idea, but it. <clears throat> Let's get this down here. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> Beavis and Butthead was amazing because adults didn't get it. Was it Buff Coat and Beaver or Beaver and something else? It's part of the dumbing down of television. So what they do is they celebrate underachievement. Agua for my bunghole. <clears throat> oh, yeah, and he keeps saying he needs. TP for his bunghole. What the hell's a bunghole? 
Those same forces that had harassed John Chris Felusi and Ralph Bakshi with the new adventures of Mighty Mouse were now harassing MTV and Mike Judge and saying this is a bad influence on kids. Not realizing that it wasn't an influence on the generation, but a reflection of the generation. It was great for exactly what it was. Two imbeciles that had nothing to do all day. You can write a lot about that. Hey, butthead, can I set this down? My hands are getting tired. No way, Beavis. <laughs> when the chicks lock in, they need to see it in your hands so they know you're cool. <sighs> there are different shows addressing different niche markets, and they're all succeeding. It's all happening at the same time that cable is taking off, and now the studios were wising up. Well, if we get one great nut to run a show, and they really know what they're doing, it could work out. We got out of school, no more school today. We got out of school. Oh, you guys, my ass. If you haven't yet heard about South Park, well, you're about to. Critics have praised the show as brilliantly funny, but many see only a lewd, offensive cartoon unsuitable for children. It was the next step in the evolution That's of right. animation. I mean, it was like The Simpsons sort of opened the door and South Park kicked the door down. Children, I'm glad you're here. I call them Chef's Salty Chocolate Balls. Hey, these are good. Yeah, I love your salty chocolate balls, Chef. <laughs> South Park, like The Simpsons, pushed the culture. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it challenged the culture. And I think adults connected to it because of that reason. Mm -hmm. you know, they appreciated the satire and how it attacked certain institutions. Oh, yeah. Because it was a cartoon. You put your defenses down. Comedy in its very nature is disrespectful. And animation is a great way to really turn the disrespect into a whole world. Dude, don't bother with new Ghostbusters. Totally not funny. Chicks ruined it. Can we get ice cream now? I want to get the taste of ass out of my mouth. They're fearless. They don't have boundaries. And they if they cross it, they're going to find the joke. They address so many things so smartly. And look, there's a lot of, you know, poo-poo, fart jokes in there. But I don't think people consider it when they consider smart, cogent, animated comedy. Or even comedy. F animation. It's just a really well-done comedy. This week, South Park has gone out on syndication. It's amazing because they're like, well, okay, now it's going out on these other channels. Let's look at how much they have to cut out. And to watch the first season, they don't cut anything out. It's very interesting to me how enduring some of those shows are. That's unusual for TV shows to be on this long, guys, especially comedies. I'm just a little boy. That's a cartoon. Millions of people watch it. How would you feel, Cal, if there was a cartoon on television that made fun of Jews all the time, huh? Uh... How do you do the How do you do the How do you do the ear? I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. Hello. Animation is often driven by distinctive, great voices. And those voices contributed as much as anything to the personalities and the success of those characters. I have to create a voice for each character. They show me the character, and Bugs, I could see, was a tough little stinker. And uh, I thought, which is the toughest voice in this country, either Brooklyn or the Bronx? So I uh, put the two of them together, Doc. <laughs> What's up, Doc? Mel Blanc was an unbelievable actor. Every one of those characters had a soul and a personality and a history. He wasn't like a witty little collection of voices. Voice acting isn't as easy as we think it is. You don't have your face now, so you have to use your voice to convey the comedy. Once you create a voice, you never forget it. The belle ear, you know, the little French skunk who kissed the pussy again. Then the porky pig will come along and fuck it at you, fuck little bird. Oh, I thought I saw a pussy cat. He could act on every one of those characters, and he was like the beacon. He lit the way for guys like me. Krusty Brand seal of approval. You can only find it on products which meet the high personal standards of Krusty the Clown. The voice talent on The Simpsons is a point of inspiration. There's always something great from the, the voice acting that you can mine for performances, how you're going to direct the shots, and overall, the look of the characters get inspired by the vocal choices. You almost start drawing characters for the voice person you have in mind, people like Tress McNeil and Billy West. I got to do voices on Futurama, and I looked at these characters, and, and I thought long and hard before I Open my mouth. Philip J. Fry. Shut up and take my money. Double. 
Dr. Zoidberg. He had all this cool meat hanging off his face, so I thought he would have like an impediment of some kind. You didn't invite Zoidberg to eat? Zoidberg could eat. Here I come! From The Simpsons, I love doing Agnes Skinner, and that's also a voice that is easy for me to do because I'm gonna be her one day, very soon. And Dot, Dot, of course, is the Warner sister. She's the cute one. That makes me feel all kind of warm and squishy. Either that or I need to wear diapers. Brilliant voices carry these cartoons. All you have to do is sit back and let them do their thing. What would you wish of me? The ever impressive. The long contained but never duplicated. 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 Genie of the Lamp. That's Robin Williams, of course, as the voice and inspiration of the genie in the bottle in Aladdin, the new Disney animated extravaganza. And he's the real star of the movie. It's an extraordinary performance. The perfect melding, if you think about it, of a talent and an art form. Robin Williams really is an animated character. Robin Williams wasn't just reading the script with his funny Robin Williams voices, he was winging it. He was improvising, and they knew they were going to use some of that. This genie is going to be what it's like to watch Robin Williams on stage. Can I talk to the kid? Thanks. The horror. Look at those fangs! I could have been a contender. I can't imagine what Robin Williams was like doing that genie. I just don't know how they did that because they had to have gone, oh boy, that was all good. And then he'd do it again differently because it is definitely Robin's deal to ad lib. This opened up a door for putting actors in animation. You weren't the real Buzz Lightyear, you're, a, you're an action figure. You are a child's plaything. You are a sad, strange little man and you have my pity. Farewell. They tried a disc jockey voice. You know, hi, Buzz Lightyear here, it was very, self-aware and he was also very confident and I went a little dumber. He's filled with bravado. He's got nothing but heart, but he also is oblivious. Well, that's fine, Woody. We'll do it your way. Voice acting, the value on it has changed completely. It used to be about a guy like Mel Blanc who could do multiple voices. Now you hire an actor to do one voice and it's usually theirs. Ah, the craggle! <laughs> My evil power will be unlimited. Can you feel me? I can feel you. Woo! Comedians have an inherent understanding of timing, and they understand improv mm -hmm. more so than I would say the, a traditional actor. Yeah, uh, and it's like joke delivery. So yeah. when you put them in a booth, they're able to. They know how to hit that punchline. Yeah. Yeah. You know. With somebody like Mike Myers, he always did characters, and so he was born to do uh, animation. I'd like you to meet my husband. Shrek. Well, um, it's easy to see where Fiona gets her good looks from. <laughs> Working without props is something that I was very, very used to. And I never saw Eddie Murphy or Antonio Bandera the whole time. You're just used to making something out of nothing, you know? What are you, no, oh, no! This is gonna be fun. We can stay up late, swapping manly stories, and in the morning, I'm making waffles. Oh! Eddie Murphy's voice itself sounds funny, but Eddie can also do funny voices. You see this chain? Once it was an instrument of oppression to keep our people down, but we can use it to keep those same people from stealing your go kart Yeah! In voiceover for animated comedy, you need people who can emote through their voice. And stand-ups are some of the best voice emoters. Comedians are very in touch with how they come across, so I think that skill lends itself to uh, voice acting. The manatee is endangered, and I think it's because it's out of shape. <laughs> Doesn't the manatee kind of look like a guest on the Ricky Lake show? <laughs> yeah, well, what you gotta do is get yourself an education and a job. I don't know what you're talking about. You're all fat, you gotta get Weight Watchers. I have a layer of blubber to keep me warm in the water. Whatever, talk to my hand. The stand-up comedian, Jonathan Katz, created this show called Dr. Katz, Professional Therapist, where he would interview comedians in squiggle vision. I just thought the manatee was such a weird animal. And so I came up with some jokes and I had this voice that went with it. It lent itself to this Dr. Katz bit. There were some bits that worked on Dr. Katz because they were visual. In fact, I thought that the animation was competing with the jokes. 
took me a while to realize that we were a team. People ask Eugene Merman, how do you get into voice acting? And he says, do 15 years of stand-up comedy. Stand-up comics are the greatest voice actors in the world. If they're willing to loan us their voice and all the years of wisdom that are contained in that voice, you're going to get the great voice, almost by definition. Channel 6 News, they'll finger anything with a pulse. I'm pretty sure their slogan is their fingers on the pulse, Gene. No. That can't be right. It's right. Tonight, we're going to present a special feature taking you inside the world of the artists and the funny men who create the modern TV cartoon. A truly great animated show is everything coming together perfectly. The voices, music, and animation, timing, the directing, editing, everything. We, as students of the masters, always want to emulate these great animators of the past. Once we have the drawing, and then we put down the drawing, we start to talk to the animator, where they, then we have to decide what, how do these characters uh, differ in terms of their postures? By the way they stand, who are they? Chuck Jones' character animations, the facial expressions in cartoons like Feed the Kitty, where uh, Mark Anthony, the big bulldog, is trying to protect a little kitten, and the facial expressions, that's all Chuck. That's literally his drawings on the screen. <laughs> Chuck Jones, who's a great master timer of the held... You know, and the, the eyes that go like... Which I just learned a lot from that. We knew we were in a cartoon when you watched the Tex Avery cartoon because he pointed you toward it constantly. Visually and verbally, I would play to the audience an awful lot. Hey, that wasn't in the uh, script. I wanted them aware that they were out there and then I knew they were out there. Tex Avery is known mostly for his outrageous or zany types of animation and his sensibility is to push the boundaries of that as much as possible. I've always liked extra jokes, I guess you could say. And Cartoon World is a land of extra jokes. So, classic Tex Avery joke, that I'm sure you've seen, was based on how people view movies in the theaters. There was always something wrong with the film. Hey, you up there! Get that hair out of here! That's the beauty of animation. That's really what you want animation to be used for, to do and see things that you've never seen before and can't be shown in live action. The tape you're watching is just a taste Mwah! of the Cartoon Network, an appetizer, a mere morsel of what you can expect from the first and only 24-hour Cartoon Network. Cartoon Network was owned by Turner Broadcasting, who now owned the Hanna-Barbera Library. They owned the rights to all of these characters, whether it was Yogi Bear or Space Ghost. Basically, you have a group of people that are working in programming, on air, making commercials, clearly very inspired by all of that Warner Brothers library. We're like, wouldn't it be fun if we like just made something like ourselves? Wow, Space Ghost, man. Crack a window, will ya? I'd be violently sucked into space. Hell, then maybe people would tune in. Space Ghost is the turning point. It's a surreal late night TV show that is unapologetically adult using kids' cartoons. Now, a lot of the people that worked on that show today are the movers and shakers of Adult Swim. All kids out of the pool for Adult Swim. They branded a block of time on the network that would just be for programs aimed at adults. They satirized truly terrible Hanna-Barbera cartoons from the early 70s, a show called Sea Lab 2020, and made it Sea Lab 2021, where they dubbed over the old animation and had them saying ridiculous, weird, and preposterous things. It's, uh, I mean, it's like a koala bear crapped a rainbow in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <Wow>. Kath. <laughs> the whole thing was keep it as absolutely cheap as possible. And if you have to keep it kind of clean because you're on a kid's network, what can you do? Just get weird. Smokey? Yeah, kid. How'd you get your name? Well... Smokey, you always got the best weed. Hello, little paw. Adult Swim not only provided certain auteur visions, but like 
the most pure version of an Octor Division. <gasps> oh man, why do we think to bring no guns? Adult Swim is fearless. Yeah. And they, they find voices that are normally marginalized on the, the major networks. Yeah. And so they're finding these counterculture voices mm -hmm. and giving them a platform. They're doing things that traditional networks are afraid to do. I really appreciate you, Morty. Okay, cool. All right, Ray. <laughs> you little son of a bitch. <laughs> are you a simulation? Huh? Are you a simulation? No, no, no. You little son of a bitch. <gasps> I'm, I'm sorry, Morty. You're a, good, you're a good kid, Morty. Jeez. You're, you're a good, you're a good kid. Oh my God. With animation, you can do any joke you want. You can have the characters be a bit meaner. You can have the jokes pop a bit more. Cause it's already not real. It's animation. And so there's, there's more wiggle room. Sorry, honey. Uh, yeah, we'll bring you a present. Oh, blow me. <laughs> Why? You couldn't feel it. What animation allows you to do is to be anonymous in your assault on other people. I can't believe this. Two weeks in prison on trumped up charges. That trial was a total sham. Yeah, I know we were in trouble the minute I saw the jury. Well, at least they're a jury of our peers. I don't think they see it that way, Peter. If you cast Family Guy, South Park, and The Simpsons with real people, they probably can't get away with as much. People always talk about, like, you can never make all in the family now because Archie Bunker wouldn't come off the same way. Well, Seth MacFarlane is making it every week. <laughs> it's like Peter Griffin is Archie Bunker. We will take it from an animated character, but we may not take it from a real person. Peter, not every Jewish person is good with money. Well, yeah, I guess not the retarded ones, but, but why would you even say that? For shock value? Jeez, Cleveland is edgy and is offensive. Good day, sir. Some box office gold for you now. Those unmistakable minions overran the box office this weekend, raking in more than $115 million in the U.S. and Canada. That is one of the biggest openings ever for an animated movie. You look at the full roster of feature films that are put out each year by the major studios. If you're really paying attention, you see the big money's going to these animated features. Be cool. This wave's got to crash. I can't. You're all alive and looking at me with your with your gloves and your, your your little shoes. I'm seeing the movies that are coming out now, and I am in awe. The level of craft seems so high. The brightest comedy I've seen this year, the last 10 years, are in the animated movies. Hey, guys, I think we're about to crash into the sun. Yeah, but it's going to look really cool. Animated comedy couldn't be more popular than it is today. There's no question about it. With the Lego movie, all the cable cartoons, it's an explosion. The reason animation is a huge deal is because even if you only made 30 episodes, you can rewatch those episodes a thousand times. <gasps> it's only gonna keep going and there are only gonna be more big shows. You have a lot of animation now coming online, which is another avenue for it, because it can be produced with much uh, greater speed than it once was. Carl, I watched you fire a harpoon into the captain's face. That sounds dangerous. The fact that there are 700 different outlets and YouTube, you can realize your dream precisely, and if it's a good one, people are gonna pay attention. I'll make short work of that grime, for my name isn't Sengar Clean. And it is. Hey, what the hell, man? We're gonna continue to see the kind of fruit that that bears because you wanna attract unique minds to animation to, to keep it flush with new ideas. There's a lot of young people who were inspired by that Ren and Stimpy generation. And they heard about the passion for animation that the creators of shows like that had. They would hear them talk about Bob Clampett and Tex Avery. So for that reason, now there's a whole generation of animators who are inspired by both generations and in doing so have emulated what is sort of a combination of retro and contemporary design, and it's beautiful. One should take great care in unpacking <laughs> the fragile components. Items can shift slightly during shipping. With the new version of Mickey Mouse, it's a combination of the old classic 
Disney style that we love, and a modern sensibility. Finally, people are allowed to like animation even if they're not under 10. There are teenagers and young adults and even old adults that are really enjoying Cartoon Network Adult Swim. Love a love a jump jump! One of the biggest shows on television right now is Rick and Morty. The landscape is so fractured now that people can really make these amazing, niche, interesting shows that do well enough to be able to make more of them. So we're really seeing some fascinating stuff right now. The possibilities are endless. The technology is improving. I think we're getting quicker turnarounds. Quicker uh, turnarounds, yeah. It can be uh, incredible. You ready, Keith? I'm ready, Kenny. Oh, hey, look at us, believing in ourselves. I think the future of animation is very bright. Kids love cartoons, and adults love cartoons. Animation can make anybody laugh. I'm gonna tell my dad you swore at me. He's a cop. Then he can solve your murder, you nosy little Frank, no! There's gonna be more inventive talent coming out there and giving us a show we hadn't seen before, and I look forward to that. <laughs> what should we watch next? What about this? Yo, -ho, olive oil. I bring you some flowers. <laughs> I think I still probably do the 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 Homer Simpson like. Oh. Sunset. Thank God there's only one of these a day. Uh, we've been looking to do a project together for a long time. Uh, hello, nurse. Yogi, why don't you eat nuts and berries like all the other bears? Nuts and berries. Sheesh. What a grouch. The ranger isn't gonna like this, Yogi. That's all, for, uh, folks.